Good afternoon, good morning, good evening. Greetings from the Red Circle to you, wherever in the world you are. I'm Alan Reddick, of course, and we'll be talking about the geography of this large audience a bit later. For now, while some folks are still joining us, and they certainly are, um, 101 now, um, I'll simply say that more than 160 have registered, as I've said before, for our second virtual meeting. Um, by the way, if you weren't at our first virtual meeting three months ago with Lori King, I also wanted to tell you that the recording of that meeting is available on our website, www.redcircledc.org. You are welcome to watch that. Lori was great, as those of you who were here at that time know. About half of you were here, according to our uh, registration list, for Lori King. And the rest of you are welcome to watch the video anytime you like. So whenever I introduce Peter Blau, I'm tempted to say nice things about him. But Peter always quotes Holmes from the Thorbridge and says, I am not in need of booming, so I shall refrain from booming and simply say, Peter, please turn on your microphone and start zooming. Peter Blau. Thank you, Alan. Uh, welcome to the Red Circle, everybody. Uh, that's our first order of business. We can dispense with the second order of business. Was just ask everybody to sit down so we make sure we have enough seats for everybody. And uh, the third order of business also, because we won't be collecting money for the dinner or the luncheon. I should note, however, that uh, Alfio's La Trattoria is open for takeout uh, if you want to order or just go pick up some of their wonderful spumoni for dessert. Uh, I recommend them highly. Okay, uh, without further ado, I want to introduce our guest speaker. He's an old friend, uh, Nick Utaken. Uh, apparently has decided to dress up as Conan Doyle's great protagonist, Captain Jack Sharkey, the pirate. And if none of you have read Conan Doyle's four Jack Sharkey stories, I recommend mine highly. Uh, I like pirates, and Conan Doyle was a very good storyteller. Uh, in real life, Nick is one of the sparking plugs of the Sherlock Holmes Society of London. Uh, he is for his sins, edited the Sherlock Holmes Journal for 30 years before retiring. Uh, Roger Johnson is out there some places trying desperately to do as good a job as Nick did. <laughs> Nick lives in Oxford, uh, and, and Oxford is a great place to visit. Uh, I won't advertise Nick's free services as a tourist guide, but he's very good. And so, Nick, over to you. Peter, thank you very much indeed for these uh, very kind words. My services, uh, I now charge, but that's, that's, for, another, that's for another time. Uh, I'm so glad to be able to talk to as many of you as, as I am. I, I'm a, from Oxford, England. The sun is uh, going down. Um, it is, uh, what time is it? Just gone five past six. Uh, over here. Uh, I should quickly point out uh, for those of you who uh, don't know me that I don't normally uh, have the uh, Captain, I, uh, Captain Sharky eye patch on, uh, but I had a, a cataract operation on my other eye uh, just before lockdown. Uh, normally they'd have done this eye as well to balance it, uh, but I just have the patch on to, um, uh, well, just create a discussion point uh, primarily. Uh, I've taken as uh, my subject uh, for talking to you guys in the Red Circle, uh, British beginnings or British beginners, uh, because a lot of you may think that all matters Sherlockian uh, began uh, with uh, Christopher Morley and the Grill Parts, however the club was called, and all those gathering, the early gatherings, the Baker Street Irregulars, and of course, the ever expanding number of science societies uh, that exist in the United States. But uh, I think it's arguable uh, that we had a bit to do with it 3,000 miles across the Atlantic over here. Um, I'd like to, be, well, not just with Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, I think almost the last time I will mention his name uh, uh, today. Uh, I think we need to go back to um, 1902. Um, in August 1901, the Strand magazine had started serialising The Hound of the Baskervilles in monthly instalments. 
And by the time that the January 1902 instalment had appeared, had already appeared, a 22-year-old uh, recently graduated uh, from Cambridge University, but that's another matter, we'll discuss that side of things later, uh, a young man uh, going into publishing uh, called Frank Sidgwick uh, wrote a letter to the Cambridge Review. Uh, Frank Sidgwick was later to found the publishing firm of Sidgwick and Jackson. And in the issue of the Cambridge Review of January the 23rd, he wrote a short article which began, Dear Dr. Watson, before the appearance of the February number of the Strand magazine, it is my desire to draw your attention to one or two points in your story. He then went on to raise a very large number of chronological problems that he saw uh, that Dr. Watson stroke Conan Doyle had put into The Hound of the Baskervilles. Uh, it's not a long piece, but it's a very telling piece of work. This is a picture uh, when he was a little bit older uh, than he was uh, when he wrote the piece. And I think there is little doubt that his article, its full name is The Hound of the Baskervilles at Fault. There's little doubt that it was the first serious contribution, I think, to what we now call Sherlockian scholarship. But it was to be another nine years before the serious, if you call it that way, grand game of Sherlock Holmes got underway. And just as Sidgwick had come from a Cambridge end of things, uh, we have to say that the next big mover, the fundamental mover, uh, was at Oxford. Ronald Knox. Uh, his full name, Ronald Arbuthnot Knox, very English name indeed. He was born in 1888. He went to prep school uh, in Oxford. Uh, then he went to Eton and then uh, got a scholarship to Balliol College, Oxford, uh, in 1906. And from there, he became a junior fellow at Trinity College, Oxford. Uh, those of you who do know Oxford uh, will know that uh, Balliol College and Trinity are right next to each other. They have an enmity, a historic enmity, but uh, in fact, uh, they, uh, Knox did not trade on that en enmity at all. He, he wanted, he was very much of a religious bent, uh, and as a young man, he joined uh, Trinity, wanting to become the dean, uh, the religious dean of the college. Uh, he was also a very fine uh, orator and speaker. He was president of the Oxford Union, the debating society, uh, and those, uh, there are many records of how well he spoke. Uh, he was also a satirist. And the vital element in this is that even at the young age of 23, uh, he was uh, wanting to point out German biblical scholarship and the problems that arose there. Uh, very strange things like uh, the, the Gospels according to Matthew and Mark uh, and the way that they told the story of the death of John the Baptist as a flashback. And uh, he was wondering, Knox was wondering, why they were doing this. Uh, maybe it was because, well, there were some questions about the authorship of those two Gospels. And so he wanted to write a paper satirising German biblical scholarship. Uh, I don't know much about that myself, the German biblical scholarship, uh, but take it from me that that's what he was aiming to do. Uh, and he wrote that uh, it is part of the functions of a don, that is, uh, a teacher, uh, a fellow of a college, uh, to read papers to undergraduate societies. Now, these undergraduate societies were something else entirely a hundred years ago. Now you've got movies, now you've got television. Uh, then uh, there were no such extraneous activities. The students of Oxford and Cambridge, but the students, all male, by the way, had to find their own methods of entertainment. And a lot of colleges, there are 37 colleges in Oxford, all of them independent. They all come under the umbrella of being Oxford University, but they're all independent foundations. And they would set up undergraduate student discussion societies. So some student would stand up and want to talk about something historical, or something literary, or something political. Um, and, and that is how they uh, had their entertainment. And um, Knox decided that he wanted uh, to contribute to this. And so he hit upon Sherlock Holmes and the minutiae, as he saw it, of Sherlock Holmes 
in which to play the game of taking a swipe at these German biblical scholars. And on Friday, the 10th of March, 1911, he spoke to an undergraduate society called the Bodley Club, uh, a club in Merton College. Uh, here's a picture of the club members. It was taken the following year in uh, 1912. Uh, and I'd like you to take a special note now, the young man seated in the middle uh, at the front. His name was Dmitry Jaripsov, and he was secretary of the Bodley Club. He was the person who took the minutes of this famous first ever recorded meeting at which the famous paper was given. Uh, he recorded the events of the meeting in the most marvellous handwriting. Uh, and here is uh, a photograph I took of the actual book in which he wrote the minutes of the Bodley Club. Uh, and the title of the paper, as you can see, is The Mind and Art of Sherlock Holmes. The Mind and Art of Sherlock Holmes. And then you can see uh, underneath that uh, the, uh, the lovely lines that Jurinsov has prefaced the report by saying, the secretary feels that it is utterly beyond his literary power to give a complete and true account of this brilliant paper. Now, the main points that Knox was making in his paper have become the basics of, of the game that we play. He discusses the differences between deduction and induction. Uh, he raises chronological problems. Uh, he talks about whether Holmes went to Oxford or Cambridge. Uh, he concentrates an awful lot on Dr. Watson, uh, and very specifically, very humorously, uh, Dr. Watson's bowler hat. Uh, and he plays games with names of made-up scholars like Pifpuf and Backnecker uh, and Professor Zabaglione. If you look at the membership uh, uh, here in the minutes and you run down one, two, three, four, five, six, seven lines, the first name you'll see there is Hunt. Hunt, if you can see it. Uh, his name, his full name was Robert Carew Hunt. He was present, as we can see, at that meeting and I met Robert Carew Hunt some years later. Uh, it makes me very proud, it makes me very it's almost emotional. Uh, many years later Carew Hunt, he was always known as Carew Hunt, uh, became a fellow of St Anthony's College, Oxford between 1955 and 59 and my father was also at St Anthony's and for some reason I have a very clear memory of uh, meeting this austere gentleman. I think he was probably younger than I am now, but that's the way things go these days. Uh, and he even for some reason gave my father uh, his own academic gown. Uh, so I have met one of the young men, he was young in those days of course, in 1911, who was present uh, to listen uh, to Ronald Knox. Um, Dmitry Jarintsov, who I pointed out earlier, who took these uh, minutes, uh, it is a, a sad thing to have to say, but here we are, a photograph taken in 1912. Uh, he was killed in action in the First World War, we don't need that one quite yet, uh, killed in action in October 1917. Now the picture that we had a brief look at just then, but well, we may as well put it up. For many years it was thought that the Griffin Club of Trinity College was the first time that Ronald Knox gave his famous paper, but in fact, uh, we discovered this uh, about 10 years ago, and that it was three days later, Monday the 13th of October, uh, three days later, he had changed the title of the talk, by the way, by then to Studies on Sherlock Holmes. This uh, photograph, uh, again, was taken in 1912. Moriarty must have been at these photographers, because we cannot find, or at least I can't find, photographs of the clubs uh, taken actually in 1911. Uh, and you can see a model right in the middle at the bottom of the front row of the Griffin itself, which is the symbol of Trinity College and the symbol of the Griffin Club, the Griffin Society. Uh, and Ronald Knox himself is there, seated third from left in the middle row. There he is, 23 years old, very important. Now, it was a great thrill for me when researching all this uh, for a Baker Street Journal Christmas Annual uh, that I went in 2010 
to go into the actual room in Trinity where he gave his famous paper. And um, I took this photograph. Uh, none of the furniture uh, is original. That's certainly not that wo rather wonderful pink chaise longue in the middle. Uh, but you can see the two doors at the back, um, back in the day, uh, and even into modern days, uh, you, uh, you would have a shared sitting room, which this is, and then two undergraduates, two students, uh, would have their own bedrooms. So those two doors at the back uh, would have been uh, one bedroom each for two students, except that Ron Knox, being a teacher, being a don, uh, would have had this whole room to himself. Uh, so he would have just had a bedroom uh, in, in, in one of those. Uh, Knox went on to read his paper at least once more in Oxford. Uh, we discovered that he uh, read it uh, to students at Keeble College. Um, there were also, just to bring an American side to things, uh, two rather famous Americans present as Rhodes Scholars in Oxford at the time. Uh, one of them was uh, a certain Christopher Morley. Uh, he was round the corner from Trinity College in New College. Uh, and also Elmer Davis uh, was a few hundred yards away at Queen's College uh, on the High Street in Oxford. Uh, neither of them attended. Studies in the literature of Sherlock Holmes became the final title of the uh, Knox talk. And in 1928, he put together a collection of his satir satirical pieces uh, called uh, not surprisingly, Essays in Satire, which contained the Sherlock Holmes article. And this is when the next important British contributor uh, to uh, Sherlockiana uh, occurred. The editor of the Cambridge Review, remember that was the place where Frank Sidrick had written his paper in 1902, uh, but uh, the editor uh, of the Cambridge Review sent a review copy of Essays in Satire to uh, a man who worked for the Cambridge University Press, Sidney Castle Roberts. And here is S.C. Roberts, uh, taken that photograph in 1941. Uh, so uh, just over 10 years uh, after uh, this uh, rather important handing over of a, a review copy. Roberts was born in the canonical year of 1887 uh, and in his youth had amazingly played a round of golf uh, with no other person than Arthur Conan Doyle. Roberts wrote a famous review of the Knox uh, book, concentrating entirely uh, on the Sherlock Holmes essay uh, and playing him at his own game, criticizing Knox for certain uh, elements that he didn't think were quite right and inventing his own list of curiously named uh, Germanic type scholars. Uh, he was proud enough uh, of this that he wanted more people uh, to see his reviews. So he had a hundred copies printed uh, for friends. Uh, it is called A Note on the Watson Problem and it's now extremely rare. Um, this is my copy of it uh, and I think we can zoom in and see a rather nice inscription that I haven't, yes we do, uh, have uh, on, on, on the front of mine. Very rare in this state. SCR. Uh, I was very happy to uh, get this copy uh, and at the moment I'm trying to trawl and find out how many copies are still extant of this uh, but there'll be more on that in something I'm publishing next year. Now Roberts wasn't done with Watson, uh, not by a long way. Uh, in 1931 uh, he contributed uh, something to a series called the Criterion Miscellany. Now, the Criterion Miscellany were published by Faber and Faber, the publishing house, uh, and incidentally, one of the people who founded Faber and Faber was Frank Morley, brother of, guess who? Christopher. And the Criterion Miscellany was a series of chapbooks. They're thin, slim, uh, single subject books uh, on items of, uh, of general interest. Uh, I could show you a, a well known picture of uh, what Dr. Watson. Uh, looks like in the Criterion Miscellany number 31, uh, but I thought we would have a bit of fun. Uh, there it is in the hands of, well, I hope a lot of you recognise the gentleman on the left with a pipe, that is Nigel Bruce, a very famous Dr Watson, uh, and pointing something out and with a, 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 a laugh on his face is of course Christopher Morley. And this was the Criterion Miscellany 1931 
uh, called Dr. Watson. We now jump um, a decade and a half. Roberts was quite involved in the next exciting bit of Britishness on Wednesday, June 6th, 1934, which was the date of the first dinner of the first Sherlock Holmes Society in England. Uh, it was held at a restaurant suitably in Baker Street called Canuto's, uh, long defunct, long disappeared, number 88 Baker Street, uh, if and when you next uh, are able to visit uh, Baker Street. Other members of this first Sherlock Holmes Society were people whose names I'm sure you recognize some of, uh, Dorothy L. Sayers, H.W. Uh, Bell, who had published his famous chronology in 1932, and T.S. Blakeney, who'd also written in the same year, Sherlock Holmes, Fact or Fiction. And Frank Morley was there as well. This was a, a fun dinner, and it wasn't expected to be anything much more than that. It was all put together uh, by the writer A.G. MacDonnell, uh, was a rather serious looking person, but he wrote some light-hearted stuff. There we are, an autobiography of a cad, and uh, how light, it, the very of his time, 1930s. Um, he brought in as president of this Sherlock Holmes Society, uh, a person called the Reverend Dick Shepherd, who was a well-known religious broadcaster and newspaper columnist. They had lots of fun at this first dinner. There was a copy of uh, Roberts's Dr. Ro uh, Dr. Watson at every uh, 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 place. Uh, Bell arrived in a handsome cab, we believe, and uh, the dinner closed with a large dish with a metal cover being presented for opening by Dick Shepherd. Surprise, surprise, under the cover, a naval treaty. The rest of the society didn't actually meet apart from dinners, and the last dinner was in 1936. Now, sadly, maybe this wasn't very typical of the 1930s, maybe it's not at all typical of life as it is today, uh, but McDonnell became, uh, let us say, closely involved with Dick Shepherd's wife. Uh, so the secretary of the Sherlock Holmes Society and the president's wife uh, had a flingette. And although matters were hush-hush uh, and lots of British stiff upper lips uh, were involved, uh, that was that, basically. And in March 1938, a terse postcard was received by the members of this Sherlock Holmes Society, uh, on which was written the words, the Sherlock Holmes Society, like the Red-Headed League, is dissolved. We now jump to 1951. 1951, Britain and the world had come out of the Second World War. Britain was a grey, austere, mostly rainy, awful place to visit. A lot of bombed out stuff, a lot of sadness, a lot of, well, obviously lives had been lost. And it was thought by the then government in 1951, now look, let's, uh, let's rejoice a little bit, let's have do something to show that Britain can refind itself. And it was decided to hold what became known as the Festival of Britain. And uh, a lot of smaller places tried to decide, smaller areas of the country tried to decide uh, how to celebrate uh, 1951 and the return of a glorious Britain uh, in their own special way. Villages were cut up, bunting and that sort of stuff. But the borough of St. Marylebone in London, towards the west of London, uh, decided that it really wanted to do something very, very special uh, towards this festival of Britain. Uh, and it was going to put on an exhibition. Uh, and this exhibition was going to be about their successes in slum clearance. Now, some members of the uh, St. Marylebone Borough Council thought that there was a better idea going. Why not celebrate the life of Marylebone's most famous resident, Sherlock Holmes, around the corner in Baker Street. And there was a discussion at a meeting of the Borough Council, and it's still in 1951, and it was decided uh, that they would go ahead with slum clearance. Whereupon, in a very, very famous correspondence in the Times newspaper, Dr. Watson took up his pen uh, and wrote and said, this is disgraceful and we must celebrate Sherlock Holmes. And this opened the floodgates and 13 or 14 or 15 letters appeared. The Times editor must have enjoyed himself. Uh, there were real people writing as well. Arthur Wontner, uh, the famous Sherlock Holmes screen actor, 
contributed a letter. And the net result, I could go through all the details, but I won't. The net result was that it was decided that the borough of St. Marilyn would go ahead uh, and it would do a, an exhibition on Sherlock Holmes. Now, the assistant reference librarian at Marylebone was the marvellously named Cyril Cranfield Thorne, universally known as Jack. A very uh, shy, um, uh, well, he, he didn't seek the limelight. It, it took quite a long time uh, when Matthias Bostrom and I were writing a Baker Street Journal Christmas Annual uh, about the exhibitions uh, to find uh, a copy of a photograph of Thorne. But there it is. Uh, and he was the, 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 the real pace setter in putting together uh, the uh, exhibition on behalf of St. Marilyn. Now, the centerpiece was to be a reconstruction of the 221B sitting room. And the details that the organisers went into was, was really quite extraordinary. Uh, among many other bits of paper, here we are. This is a sketch, a drawing by Thorne, of what was to be on the dining table in the reconstruction. And if you look closely, uh, you'll see, it's called the tea table, uh, but you can see that uh, he was going to want some Egyptian cigarettes, a box of Egyptian cigarettes there. Uh, a, a tin of ship's tobacco had to be there. If you look over to the left, uh, there are four uh, muffins, uh, four muffin, it says muffin dish. Uh, there was a story about those muffins, apparently, uh, at the exhibition, uh, new freshly baked muffins were put on show every single day and some poor so-and-so had a job of taking one bite out of two of these muffins each day so that it would appear that Holmes and Watson had been called away suddenly uh, while having their breakfast. Uh, but this was the extraordinary detail uh, that they went into and in fact we can see uh, a picture of the table as it actually ended up in the reconstruction. Uh, I can't quite see it. The far end uh, will be the cigarettes and the tobacco can I see a muffin at this end? I'm not sure. But look how close visitors were, were able to get to, to see it. The exhibition opened on May the 22nd, 1952. It ran until September. Well over 50,000 visitors. It was a huge success. Uh, this was the, the poster for it. It was held, I should have mentioned, right just around the corner from Marylebone Library in Abbey House in what is now Upper Baker Street on the site of the address of 221B. Sadly, even that building that it was in, which was uh, a very modern building uh, back in the day in the 1930s and 50s, uh, ha has now gone. Uh, on the opening day, there was a rather important uh, trio of official uh, visitors. Uh, on the left opening day, Dame Jean Conan Doyle. In the centre, the older of her two brothers, Dennis Conan Doyle, and then the elderly lady, is Mary Doyle. All the time working with Jack Thorne at the library were three people who to, were to be rather instrumental in founding the second British Sherlock Holmes Society. Here they are in a photograph that I took in uh, 2001, 50 years on. In the middle is Frida Howlett, who was originally Frida Pierce, and she was Jack Thorne's assistant at the library. To the left is Colin Prestige, who in 1951 was a young and rising solicitor. And on the right was Anthony Tony Howlett, who later, of course, married Frieda. Frieda, of course, died earlier this year, two months after she was invested in the Baker Street Irregulars at the age of 101, which was, uh, she was very happy to receive that investiture and knew that she had received it. All this preparation, these three especially, uh, had uh, given them an idea. Tony Howlett wrote later, Thursday the 20th of February in the year 1951, the most fateful date in the history of the world. By nine o'clock, we were in desperate need of refreshment and adjourned to Allen's Bar, a pub opposite St. Marylebone Library. Here, under the stimulus of alcohol, a brilliant idea was involved. And that brilliant idea was the Sherlock Holmes Society of London, which flourishes to this day. Now, for a long time, Allen's Bar didn't mean anything to us. You wouldn't normally have called a pub a bar in the London of the 1950s. And all the buildings opposite Marylebone Library had been, uh, had been pulled down a long time ago. This is when you come into London down the Marylebone Road from the west, from Oxford, actually. 
Uh, I don't know how people from Cambridge get into work hunting, but that's another matter entirely. So uh, eventually we tracked down the original place, the Allsop House. Here it is in a, in a separate photograph. It's the building behind these marches on the corner. You can see people standing uh, on a balcony. This is a photograph that has not been seen publicly before, uh, and we, we can't get a better reproduction of it. But uh, above, it, at the top, it says Wapnes, which was the brewer who owned the pub. And then the square notice beneath that says the Allsop House, uh, right next to the lady uh, in, in the white dress. And that is the pub where, if, there's, if there was going to be a blue plaque, a heritage plaque, that's where we should have been able to put it until it was torn down, saying this is where the, Sherlock, the first idea for the Sherlock Holmes Society in London uh, came. Um, they approached S.C. Roberts, surprise, surprise, to be its first president. Uh, but he wasn't at all sure. Uh, his quote was, uh, frankly, I do not feel very keen about an elaborately organized Sherlock Holmes society, nor do I favor the proposed journal. The Baker Street Journal, published in New York, seems to me to contain a lot of rubbish, and I think it would be virtually impossible to maintain a high literary standard. Well, I have to say, 69 years on, as we sometimes say over here, Yar Boo Sucks Sydney. Uh, I think the Baker Street Journal and the Sherlock Holmes Journal uh, have done uh, quite well. I used to work for the BBC, uh, where much excellent work was also done under the stimulus of alcohol. Indeed, uh, I should just take a refresher. So it is not at all difficult to understand the importance of bars or pubs in the world of creativity. Uh, in fact, a certain uh, London pub was very seriously linked uh, after the, yes, there we go, after the 221B reconstruction had been taken over to New York for a second exhibition, no one knew what to do with the contents of the exhibition. But in 1957, the Brewers Whitbreads decided to rename the Northumberland Arms, which uh, they owned in Northumberland Street, just off Trafalgar Square. If you go down towards Whitehall, off Trafalgar Square, and branch off to your left, that's Northumberland Avenue, and Northumberland Street is just, just off Northumberland Avenue, but parallel. A lot of you, I'm sure, will know the Sherlock Holmes pub, uh, but that uh, is, is, is where the reconstruction went. The society was very well represented at its opening on the 12th of December, 1957, under its new name of uh, the Sherlock Holmes. In fact, surprise, surprise, there's our old friend, uh, S.C. Roberts uh, standing there chatting facing us uh, and uh, another very important person uh, who was uh, well extremely important in the early years of the Sherlock Holmes Society of London uh, is here standing beneath a portrait of Conan Doyle that is Lord Donegal the sixth Marquis of Donegal uh, who was uh, my predecessor actually as editor of the Sherlock Holmes journal. So in a sense that is where we are. The great British beginnings uh, from 1950, from 1952, from 1902, Frank Sidgwick, uh, via Ronald Knox. There is discussion about Ronald Knox. How important was it? I think we can probably say that it is the, the fundamental essay that did the, start the game rolling. Then we jump to the first Sherlock Holmes Society, the famous Festival of Britain, the exhibition which cannot be overstated in terms of importance to at least British Sherlockians. Uh, and thus, here we go. The Sherlock Holmes Society of London will celebrate its 70th anniversary next year, 2021. Uh, one hopes that the uh, present difficulties will have uh, lifted by then and that we will be able to uh, 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 celebrate it properly uh, in, in, in that year. But I hope I've given you an idea of how things uh, went uh, over on this side of the Atlantic. Uh, and so thank you from Oxford. I've over, overstepped my welcome, I think. Thank you. Oh, no, you have not overstepped your welcome. <laughs> it was wonderful. Everybody's cheering. I can see them doing it on the, on the uh, little thumbnails all, all over the country and all over the world. Great job, uh, and we really did appreciate it. Uh, wonderful stuff. Uh, I would like to tell everyone, please, uh, I've been scouring the chat log for questions. If you have some, please, please, please uh, type them into the chat log. 
we do have one here. Uh, I want to see Andrew Bassford. If you would turn on your microphone and ask your question of Nick, we would love to hear from you. Well, my question was in regards to the uh, the Watson problem work, and I was wondering if there was an, a copy archived somewhere, whether physical or PDF, that might be accessible. That's a very, very good question. Um, in, a, in an example of self uh, shameful plugging. Um, I'm involved in, in writing for next year, not this year's, but next year's uh, Baker Street Journal Christmas Annual. We are, we are homing in on Sir Sidney Roberts. Uh, and I've started to do a list of how many copies we can find of the, a note on the Watson problem. I know that there is a copy uh, in the uh, Sherlock Holmes collections in Minnesota. Uh, intriguingly, uh, I'm hoping that uh, people involved with Minnesota, of whom I know that one is present uh, today, might be able to go in and have a look at that one day when the library is open again, because it's John Bennett Shaw's copy of a note on the Watson problem, and the bastard has got a copy of a letter, has got a letter from S.C. Roberts pasted in. Uh, so uh, we, I do not know of a digital uh, a copy available. Uh, it will be reprinted, <coughs> in this uh, Baker Street Journal <laughs> Christmas Annual next year. Thank you, thank you, Andrew, and thank you, Nick, and Edith. Edith. That was a great talk, I really enjoyed that a lot. Thank you, Edith. I was wondering if there's any record of um, any response uh, by Arthur Conan Doyle to uh, Ronald Knox's talk or his essay? Because there seems to be in- Yes, there is, yes, there is. Okay. <laughs> yes, there is. Yes, there is. Oh, God damn it. Uh, um, 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 hang on, hang on, hang on. But, but, but what Knox did is send a copy of it uh, and he wrote, what page is this on? What, oh, God blimey, Riley. Hang on. Well, the answer is that there is. And if you give me a moment, I will, f I will find it. I will find it. I will find it. He actually played the game. He enjoyed it. Conan Doyle actually wrote, 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 wrote. Uh, if there's another question, I'll come back if, in a second. If I just, just turn the pages, it's ridiculous, this. No, actually, a, actually, I will take the opportunity to please, please invite everybody, anybody, everybody, to uh, have some more questions typed into chat for Nick, because we're having a lot of thank yous and a lot of compliments, but not many questions. Anyway, yes, I mean, yeah, he... Uh, it won me the privilege of a letter from Sir Arthur Conan Doyle himself, who did not quite seem to have realised that the criticism was not meant to be serious. Uh, so he, but, but Doyle, if I could actually just find uh, the uh, piece himself, uh, Doyle does actually say, uh, and he, he refers, Doyle himself refers to uh, Pif Poof and Backnecker and these pseudo scholars. So he, in fact, I think Doyle himself did have his tongue in his cheek uh, when he was responding. Uh, to Knox, and he, he was almost seeing that there was a game to be played. Well, I, I always wondered whether his line about Watson being one fixed point in a changing age was, was a quote from Knox, because Knox says something very, very similar much earlier. And so I always thought, well, I wonder if he's just, you know, <laughs> responding to that in fiction. Now, that is an interesting point and a link that I had not made. Uh, so that, 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 that could well be it. Uh, but Knox clearly was um, blowing his own trumpet to a certain extent. And I mean, why not if you can just, you know, because how old was Kenny Doyle in 1911? I mean, there was, there, was a lot of, there was a lot of time for Doyle to go on writing. Uh, and uh, he, yeah, he did, uh, he did, he wrote him. You should get a copy of this Baker Street uh, thing. I wrote it 10 years ago. From Piff Poof to Backnecker, it's called. If they've still got copies there. <laughs> Thank you. So Thank you, Edith. And next we go to Mary. Mary Pagonis, if you would turn your microphone on and say hi to Nick. Um, I just had a question. Um, since uh, you hail from across the Atlantic, would you well, how would you characterize the difference, if there is any, between American and um, British uh, playing of the game or just Sherlockian fandom in general? Uh, well, first of all, I wouldn't use the word, and let's not get into fandom. Okay, that, sorry. That, okay, I mean, that's, no, no, I mean, we can discuss fandom or the concept for, for, for a long time. In fact, that is one big difference straight away, I think. I mean, fandom, uh, I, I, I stand to be corrected, uh, as a concept is, is a little bit more, I think, American than it is 
than it is over here. Uh, no, I mean, I think there are one or two up and coming uh, reasonable American scholars uh, uh, who might uh, possibly eventually make their mark uh, <laughs> contributing to the great game. No, of course, I joke. Uh, I, it, it's, it, it, it just shows the extraordinary uh, success of how Conan Doyle created the two characters that we all love, where it's always 1895. And, you know, I haven't yet quite seen a British writer do what many, many years ago, uh, I, I remember when I was just starting out, somebody writing uh, in an American journal, uh, proving that Mycroft Holmes was a computer. Um, this was a level of scholarship that uh, was, was, was new to me. Uh, and uh, I have tried to transcend in my own writings and, 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 and try and choose and, and hope that people will, will, will do better than that. Uh, but in, in general, the, 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 the quality of output in the States is, is, uh, is almost second to none. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Ross Davies, Professor of Theos. Yeah, that's, that's a problem. Ah! Well, having, so, having so rarely muted myself, I don't have a lot of practice at that. Uh, so do I recall correctly, Nick, that it was to that early Sherlock Holmes Society meeting that McDonnell brought his discovery of the field bazaar? Uh, I don't know. I, I, I simply cannot. I, 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 it doesn't ring a bell with me when I was... Uh, when I was Checking on it. Hang on one second. Whoopsie-daisy. I have at hand, amazingly, a report from the, uh, a report uh, of April the 11th, 1934, uh, referring to the uh, meeting. And now I've got to take my glasses off and have a quick look here. Uh, nothing that I can see, but that's a very quick, it's a very quick look, and the, the answer is I don't know off, off my own uh, head, but I will certainly check that out, Ross, and I can let you know. Thank you. Thank you, Ross. A lawyer that un doesn't unmute himself certainly is worthy of some, some acclaim here at the Red Circle. <laughs> that's right. Um, <clears throat> let's see, Roger Johnson had a comment, at least. Roger, let's hear that. As far as I remember, uh, the letter from Conan Doyle to uh, Knox included a statement to the effect that Knox evidently knew rather more about Sherlock Holmes than he himself did. Yes, 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 you're absolutely right. So here we go, here we go, here's the answer to everyone, and we've got it, 44, 44. Uh, I could read it out, but it'll take some time. It's not very long. But I mean, for example, here's Conan Doyle saying one point which has not been remarked, actually I should put on a Scots accent here, one point which has not been remarked either by the learned Sawash or the no less erudite Biffboof is that in a considerable proportion of the stories, I dare say a quarter, no legal crime has been committed at all. Another point, one of the few on which I feel satisfaction, but which I have never seen mentioned, is that Watson never for one instant, as chorus on chronicler, transcends his own limitations. And he finishes off anyway, many thanks and renewed amazement at the trouble you have taken. Yours sincerely, Arthur Conan Doyle. Thank you, Randall, for telling me to turn to page 44. Indeed, thank you, Randall. Um, M.K. Brennan has, a, has a, what you call a silly question, but I don't think it's silly. I think it's <laughs> M.K. I, kind of, I think it's kind of trite, but we've long been told that we Americans use the term Sherlockian and you British are Holmesians. You just use the term Sherlockian. Is that cultural creep? I'll talk about, I'll, I'll, I'll reply to you in one second about creep, but for heaven's sake, don't say Holmesian. Where Holmesian came, I don't know. It's Holmesian. It's straightforward Holmesian. So it's Sherlockian and Holmesian. Uh, somebody, wrote to me, somebody wrote to me not so long ago saying, do, do you guys say Holmesian? And I I, I simply don't know where that started, so, so scrub that out entirely. <coughs> as far as I'm concerned, uh, they both mean exactly the same, and because the word, and it's easier uh, for, for people immediately to understand and, and get the grip of what you're talking about, just to say Sherlockian. Uh, so I'm, 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 I'm quite easy. I'm quite easy on, on Sherlockian or Holmesian. Uh, Holmesian, there are other Holmeses in the world. There are no other Sherlocks. 
Um, Bob Katz would like to open a can of worms. Bob? <laughs> Am I on? Yeah, you're on. Okay. You're so on, I, didn't, I didn't want to, you know, disappoint Nick, who knows I would bring this up, but someday, Nick, we need to have a transatlantic debate between about the the nature, and, and I'm only half joking because I think there are some cultural differences between Sherlockian scholarship produced at Oxford, which I presume you would espouse, versus Cambridge, which I'm sure you'd love to debate somebody like uh, Jonathan McCafferty, versus that which emanated from Haverford College. And I know it'd be hard to find somebody to support that, but I suspect we could dredge someone up to do it. <laughs> well, one of, the, one, of the, uh, one of the annoying things in my, in my Holmesian life uh, is that I've only been able to attend two uh, Baker Street irregular dinners. Uh, two Januarys, one in 2009 and one in 2011. And it may be that those who were present at the one in 2009 uh, will have heard me debate exactly this uh, with Guy Marriott, uh, who came from the other Fenland base. Yes, it was Guy, I'm sorry, you're right. Yeah. Uh, so there has been a, 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 a debate on it. Um, I see little points in much debate. Uh, I think it is fairly accepted, obviously, uh, that he came from... Uh, he attended the university down the road from where I am. Uh, but I'm, I, I'm very happy to discuss this with a slight sad tinge uh, with anyone who, 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 who rides to the Cambridge rescue. Well, I'm thinking of Haverford, but the next time you're in, the, you're in New York, Nick, I will definitely get in my car and drive you out to the main line of Philadelphia so that you can see Haverford College. And as I said, I think someday we need to have a three-way debate about the nature of Sherlockian scholarship that's emanated from those three institutions, because I think there are actually some cultural differences. Right, right. Well, uh, I, I, I will be absolutely up for that, uh, especially if you're a good driver. Yeah. <laughs> we'll take an Uber. Yeah, we'll take an Uber. Very good. Um, thanks, Bob. Uh, Bev Wallop has an interesting question. Bev? I'm unmuted. Okay, so I get the point about these starting out as male groups study because that's how they were coming out of college and study groups and, you know, so forth and so forth in clubs. But I'm curious, was there any evidence of any female interest in Sherlock Holmes or any female Sherlockian groups or anything along those lines? In Britain? Any place. Well, I mean, there's action in in, in this country, but yes, in Britain. Well, one of the things I am delighted to be able to say, and it's not making or proving a point, uh, is that the Sherlock Holmes Society of London, and I'm talking about the present Sherlock Holmes Society of London, or the one that was founded in 1951, uh, has always been open to uh, men and, and women uh, equally, so there's never been a, any problem about that. Uh, there's, there's no point in going over the old situation with the big street irregulars, etc, etc, uh, and, and indeed other, uh, other societies. Um, <coughs> I mean, I mentioned in, <coughs> I'm sorry, in the 1934 society, there was Dorothy L. Sayers. Uh, on the other hand, she was uh, you know, an extremely leading writer and, and a very well-known person and a, and a leading Sherlockian, as, as, as we all know. Um, the, the, the point, as I mentioned earlier, about the undergraduates at Oxford and Cambridge and indeed all universities is that they were all men. Uh, that's just the way it was. Uh, and, and, and so, uh, you know, Knox would inevitably have only had a male audience. Um, obviously, it is a delight that uh, things have become, in almost all cases, uh, much more open. Well, I mean, I, I understand that point, but where I'm going was there's women's schools, you know, there are women in college. I, I just was curious whether women were as interested in homes at that time. And now that you're bringing up the fact that in the 1930s, the British society allowed women, I wonder why it took so long for the American BSI to do the same. I couldn't possibly comment there. <laughs> <laughs> Is I can it? see, I can feel hackles rising uh, <laughs> all, 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 all over the eastern seaboard and, and wherever you guys are. No, I mean, that's, that's an argument, for, that's a discussion for another day. Um, I mean, it's a, but it is a good question. I cannot, off the top of my head, think of 
a, a female contribution to early Sherlock Holmes game playing. Um, uh, I, I, I really can't. I think it's quite important to remember that in fact it was a woman, uh, the wife of, come on, think Nick, think Nick, uh, the person who published Beaton's Christmas Annual, uh, Ward, etc, etc, Steve Rothman, help me out. It was a woman who decided to accept uh, that, her, that her husband should accept uh, a study in Scarlet to go into Beaton's Christmas Annual. Uh, so let, actually, yes, that's quite an important point. Uh, it was she who talked him into it. Uh, but no, I mean, the, on the broader point, I don't think I can help you on that, really. Okay, thanks. Great. Well, thank you, Nick, and thank you, Bev. And that brings us to the end of our question queue for today. So we'll call a halt to the questions and say, it's time for a word from our sponsor. Aha, my dear Watson. At last, everything is clear to me. Then you have solved the mystery. Completely. What do you see there? Only a very ordinary looking fire. Indubitably. But there are several clues which seem to have escaped your notice. Four, to be precise. Really, I don't see... First, it is a very small fire. True. Second, the use of fire bricks tends to confine the fire to a small area. Yes, but third, the fresh pieces of coal on top indicate that the fire has been recently lit, and yet the day is already far advanced. Granted, but Now observe closely, and you will discover several half-burnt cinders, obviously salvaged from a previous fire. Yes, you're perfectly right. Let's go, my dear Watson. The case is finished. Then you know who robbed the Bank of England on the night of July the 14th. Oh, that little affair. No, I've made a much more important discovery. Pray what, my dear Holmes? I know how to save fuel in the winter of 1943-44. Holmes, you amaze me. Elementary, my dear Watson. Deduction, my dear Holmes? No, reduction, my dear public. I don't know how you can, I don't know how you can top that. But I do have a question because we're going to turn it over to Peter Blau now pretty quickly. And my question for Peter is why is it especially appropriate, Peter, that we run this trailer as part of a red circle meeting? Do you, do you have the answer to that, Peter Blau? Well, I have an answer, perhaps. Uh, it is the only British television or film commercial that I could find in our massive commercial archives. That's a commercial from 1943, back in the days when they didn't do that on television. They did that in movie theaters. And unfortunately, we don't know who the actors were who played Holmes and Watson, uh, but it's fun to see these old commercials. That's preserved in the archives of the British Pathé. They do a, have a wonderful website, BritishPathé.com, and uh, you can see all sorts of weird things, including footage of the Festival of Britain in 1951 and other things. Is that the answer you were looking for? Well, not exactly. I was thinking. I was thinking that 1943 was the year that Sherlock Holmes in Washington was also released. <laughs> <laughs> so, therefore, that's possible. Also, Faces, Death, and Secret Weapon are also released in 43. But uh, I thought that made especially nice sense for the Red Circle. Peter, it's back to you now for the announcements and this one. Okay, I, sh I should note, uh, by the way, that uh, we're happy to have more interim announcements. If you would like to announce something of general interest to our multitude here, please tell us by chat. And Alan Reddick will, will uh, survey these as he did so well for the questions for Nick. Uh, I should also note that the, it was a late John Bennett Shaw who gave the best explanation I know of between American and British enthusiasts. And John explained that in the United States, the Holmesians call themselves Sherlockians. And in Britain, the Sherlockians call themselves Holmesians. Uh, but uh, there's long, as people know, uh, the Sherlockians have long played the grand game that Ronald Knox did so well, trying to explain or explain away the contradictions and puzzles in the stories. And Nick Utaken has done just that. Uh, he has uh, a approached the argument over where Sherlock Holmes went to university. Uh, it's a controversy, as they say in Britain, or a controversy over here. And his book is called The Controversity. We well, are very kind, uh, uh, Peter, to uh, allow me to make mention of this. Uh, it's called The Controversy. Uh, was Sherlock Holmes at Oxford? 
uh, or, or Cambridge. And all I did, uh, I, I brought it out last, last year uh, in an edition of uh, 100 numbered signed copies. Uh, all I did was uh, marshal the arguments. I, I, I reached no decision. I just tried to follow every single scholar from Dorothy Arcea through Blakeney, through Bell, through um, many more modern people, uh, <laughs> contributions as to which university uh, home Sherlock Holmes went to. Was it Cambridge or Oxford? Uh, I don't think it was Haverford College, but we'll leave that aside. Um, and uh, well, you've been kind enough to, to, to mention this. I, I do have one or two copies left of this, uh, and uh, there is my uh, email address. And if anyone uh, is potentially interested uh, in, in uh, seeing this uh, booklet for real, uh, then uh, do, do get in touch with me on that email address. And that's, that's very kind. And I also want to point out, if nothing else, uh, that on page uh, 20, there is this excellent photograph of myself, where's the camera, and you, Peter, in outside Logic Lane University College in High Street, Oxford, uh, when you visited us in 2008. So this, this book is worth it for that photograph alone, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Nick. Uh, the next announcement is about the Red Circle's pins. Tom Fars, are you there? Um, there we go. As everybody can see, we do have a Red Circle pin. Um, replica of it on your screen. My email address is there. So if you're interested in getting one or more, uh, send me an email. I will fill in the details. Just quickly, the first pin is, that you would buy to a single address is $14.95. Uh, every additional pin to the same address is only $10 more. We accept uh, checks, money orders, all unmarked bills, and starting with this meeting, we now have the ability to take PayPal. So uh, the address is on the screen, it'll be on the website. Uh, you can look that up, get in touch with me, and I will fill out the details, and you'll get a pin or pins very shortly after that. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Tom. I, sh I should note that only members of the Red Circle are entitled to wear these pins and that anybody can be a member of the Red Circle. Uh, we're one of the most informal of the Sri Lankan societies with no entrance examination, no membership requirements, no dues, no treasurer, no treasury. Uh, anybody who wants to be a member can be a member and you can proudly wear our pin. Okay, next I wanna say a word about the Beacon Society, which is a, a grand, scheme to encourage youngsters to learn about Sherlock Holmes. And I'll call on Carla. Hi, have you made a significant contribution to exposing young people to the stories of Sherlock Holmes this past, past year? Or do you know of a person, a society, or an other organization that's done so? If so, you can nominate them for the Susan Z. Diamond Beacon Society Award. The nominations are open through November 15th and details are at the Beacon Society website, which is easily enough, beaconsociety.com. Thanks, Peter. Thank you, Carla. Uh, the next announcement is mine. The next big event coming up in the Sherlockian world will be on September 23rd, which is when the new film, Enola Holmes, will be launched on Netflix. Uh, this is going to be a lot of fun. Uh, the New York Times has listed it as one of the best movies and TV shows coming to Netflix, Amazon, and more in September. Uh, this is the movie is based on the first of six pastiches written by Nancy Springer. It's about the younger sister of Sherlock Holmes who is confronted with a real problem. Her mother has disappeared. And uh, the story got the attention of Bobby Millie Brown, uh, who is uh, famous amongst people who are younger than I am. And she has got this film going. It will never make it into the theaters now. So Netflix picked it up. 
Uh, the good news is that you don't have to be a subscriber already. Netflix very kindly offers a 30 day free trial. Okay, uh, the next event coming up is going to be a Saturday with Sherlock Holmes in Baltimore. Carla, you want to tell us about that again? Sure. Who is your favorite canonical character? Not counting Holmes and Watson. Join us on Saturday, November 14th at 10 a.m. Eastern Time when nine Sherlockians will share their favorites and tell you why they should be yours. This is Saturday with Sherlock Holmes's 41st year, and although it may have a different format than usual, we promise an interesting and fun time. This free event is sponsored by the Six Napoleons of Baltimore, Watson's Tin Box of Ellicott City, and the Sherlockians of Baltimore. The link to the registration is going to be at uh, the Red Circle's website as well as the various sponsors' websites. So please join us. Thanks, Peter. Thank you, Carla. Uh, the next uh, really big event is going to be the Sherlockian birthday festivities in New York. And we will be celebrating Sherlock Holmes' birthday again in January 2021, but we'll be doing it virtually rather than in person. Uh, you can find details on that at the uh, BSI website, which is www.bakerstreetirregulars.com. Uh, there will be a distinguished speaker lecture on Thursday, an annual dinner on Friday, and we assume other events going on as well. Uh, by the way, if you would like notifications by email of uh, more information about the birthday festivities as is available at the B Baker Street Journal, uh, Baker Street Regulars website, you can sign up for news from the BSI by email. And you will get occasional announcements. And I will also note that at the BSI website, there is a link to uh, the fortnightly dispatch, which every two weeks, Steve Doyle uh, puts up an interview uh, with a Sherlockian. And uh, all of them are quite interesting and uh, recommended. And beyond that, we have uh, the British beginnings, which we hope will actually take place next year. Ross, are you still with us? Thank you, Peter. I am still with us and uh, I am unmuted again. Uh, just to say very briefly that uh, the weekend of June 25th through 27th of next year, we are looking forward uh, with great hope and excitement to welcoming uh, many Sherlockians and Holmesians and even Holmesians uh, <laughs> to, uh, to the Bear Mountain Inn, which is about 45 <laughs> minutes up the Hudson River from New York City. You can get there easily by car, by private transportation, by public transportation, rail, bus. It's a very accessible place, and yet at the same time, it's in a beautiful uh, sort of rural environment at a conference and resort called the Bear Mountain Inn. We're going to have many, many interesting presenters and fun activities, and we, we hope to see uh, all of you there. Uh, and just to reinforce something Peter said about registering for email updates at the BSI's webpage, uh, by registering for email updates there, you'll, be, you'll get all the latest news about this conference and when registration opens up next year and so on and so forth. So here's hoping that we'll be seeing you there. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Ross. Uh, there are doings near Washington, D.C. in Baltimore, and I can call on Greg, Newby, uh, Greg Ruby next. What's going on in Charm City? Thank you, Peter. Um, the Sixth Napoleons will be celebrating our 74th anniversary in six days. Our next meeting will be on Monday, September 14th. We'll be featuring Carla Coop giving a presentation on the ordnance maps of London. We invite anyone to join us virtually for this meeting. I will post the link in the chat section in a minute, or you can also see our email address there as well. I also happen to be involved with another Sherlockian group called the Sherlockians of Baltimore. Uh, our next meeting will be on November 21st. Charles Prebelek will be the speaker, um, giving us a presentation on the early works of Arthur Conan Doyle. 
leading up to the Hounds of the Baskervilles. And from there, Rich Christinus will take on a discussion of the Hound of the Baskervilles, and it will be a quiz on the Hound of the Baskervilles. Also do a brief plug here, our annual journal, the newspapers, is available there. If you have any questions, please contact SherlockBaltimore.com. Thank you, Greg. Uh, I should note that the Red Circle of Washington has its own mailing list. If you would like to be on our mailing list, there is one of my email addresses, peter at redcirclebc.org, and we'll be glad to add you to the group. And uh, we come now to the question of whom would you like to have as our next guest speaker? If there is somebody you'd particularly like to hear, uh, let me know. It's very nice that we don't have to uh, fly people in to our meetings and put them up and feed them. Uh, although I can mail a small bottle of whiskey, I guess. But uh, if there is somebody you would particularly like to hear, uh, we can set that up. And we don't have anybody scheduled yet for December. So please let us know what you would like us to do for a guest speaker. Uh, we have a very nice quiz devised by Dana Richards, who is our official quiz master. But since he's not tuned in, I don't think he's tuned in, uh, the quiz will be administered by Dan Stashauer. And just before we get over to Dan for the quiz, since you are watching this on a, on a playback, on a recording, uh, one of the vagaries of Zoom, which I will never understand, is that they don't show the question panels in the recording. So you won't see those. If you want to see the questions uh, of the, the quiz given by uh, Dan and written by Dana, you can go to our website, Red, Red Circle website, www.redcircledc.org, where you'll find a copy of the questions. Meanwhile, since Dan repeats the questions and the possible answers a couple of times for each question, I think you can enjoy the quiz just as it stands. So here's Dan. As, as Peter mentioned, uh, this, is, this quiz was devised by our puzzle master, Dana Richards. I am not myself luminous. I'm only a conductor of light. Some people, without possessing genius, have a remarkable power of stimulating it. And that is certainly the case here. We're going to put up the quiz uh, questions in a moment. In each puzzle, your job is to choose the one answer that is not like the others. One of these things is not like the others. One of these things does not belong. There's a clue included with each question that should guide you to the right answer. Alan, you ready? Okay. Clue number one. The key word is ultraviolet. And the possible answers are Westbury, Smith, Jones, and Hunter. Westbury, Smith, Jones, and Hunter. And you should be seeing that Alan has thrown up a slide in which you can key in your answer now. And the answers, uh, the answers are coming in. Um, we, yeah, it takes a little bit of thinking, but people are starting to respond. Um, boom, boom, boom. I'm not, going to, I'm not going to show you how the results are going just yet until we get a few more people responding. Um, but we do have a great 40, 50 say, oh, no, God. come on, folks. There's more of you out there. If 100 of you out there, we need 100 answers. So let's do it. And if you don't answer, you run the risk of me reading the clues one more time oh, no, no. in my slow, ponderous tones. How about if I do this? How about if I, I say we're going we're gonna to end it in five Four, three, two, one, and that's it. Okay, now here's the fun, or part of the fun anyway. Dana, um, not Dana, Dan, we, <laughs> we will share the results. We'll see how everybody responded. Most of you have gone for Jones, and that is the correct answer. Uh, the others are, in fact, violets. Violet Westbury, Smith, and Hunter, and Jones is not. As far as we know, there is not a Violet Jones to be found anywhere in the pages of Sherlock Holmes. 
the best we could do was a felony, I think. <laughs> that's it. All right, so that's question one. Keep track of your own score, everybody, because at the end we're going to, you know, we're going to declare a winner at some point. Okay. Number two, the phrase to, that pays is, are you there, Watson? And the possible answers are the blanched soldier, a case of identity, the Mazarin stone, and the lion's mane. Once again, those possible answers are blanched soldier, case of identity, Mazarin stone, lion's mane. And the clue, are you there, Watson? Ladies and gentlemen, key in your answers, please. You, you do this very well. You know, you could be in a train station or something. It would be <laughs> now leaving on track five. Nobody's better at speaking in a slow monotone than I am. All right. The answers are coming in a little more slowly. This time we're doing all right. We're getting a few here. Another 20 people would be nice, but uh, I'll do it again. Five, four, three, two, one, end. And we'll show you how you answered. It's a, okay. It's a tie, uh, a tie in terms of folks. Yeah, uh, there is actually a, a tie between case of identity and lion's mane. The correct answer uh, is, in fact, case of identity, which was written by Dr. Watson and the others were not. So there, keep track so of there. Keep track that's of pretty. That's a pretty good one. But again, do not blame me. Blame Dana. <laughs> and our third is the, your keyword. The phrase that pays is primary colors, question mark. And the possible answers are red, blue, yellow, and green. The clue is primary colors. The possible answers are red, blue, yellow, and green. Ladies and gentlemen, Please key in your answers now. Doing very well. The answers are yeah, yeah, okay. We give them another 10 seconds, I think, on this one. I've answered, but of course, I have the answers in front of me. Oh, yeah, yeah. You, a notor no, notorious cheat that you are. Yes. That's it. All right. We'll say five, four, three, two, one. That one's over, and the results are pretty well. I think. Uh, I think. Yeah. <laughs> Green seems to be the overwhelming favorite, and as most of you have have uh, perceived, uh, the other colors, red, blue, and yellow, appear in story titles. Green does not. Right. Uh, Dana was very clever with that one. Number four. The clue is. I do, or do I? And the possible answers are the problem of Thor Bridge, the noble bachelor, a scandal in Bohemia, the solitary cyclist. So the clue is I do, or do I? And the possible answers, Thor Bridge, noble bachelor, scandal, solitary cyclist. People are taking a little more time thinking about this one. The answer yeah, that, that, yeah, this one's a thinker. No yep. question about it. Yeah. This one is the full Dana. Yeah, the full Dana. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, now they're starting to come in. And uh, we'll give them mm, five, four, three, two, one. And we'll end that one, and we'll show you how you answered. Well, pretty good. Just over 50% went for the problem of Thor Bridge, which is the correct answer. And it is the correct answer because there is no marriage or attempted marriage during this story. And of course, in Noble Bachelor, Scandal and Solitary Cyclist, 
there are. Okay. And our next clue is forever in the Cox vault. And the possible answers are Isadora Persano, Colonel Warden, James Fillimore, and Bertie Edwards. Again, this one takes some thought. And please, direct your complaints to Dana, not me. Forever in the Cox vault. Isadora Persano, Colonel Warburton, James Fillimore, or Bertie Edwards. I am putting in what I know to be the correct answer, and I invite the rest of you to do the same. And the answers are coming in. I can, I can see them come in and, and the rest of you can't. So that's why I'm keeping a close eye on the count as well as the answers. Well, we have 30, 40, 50, 70. And most of you are still with us. Punch in a few more folks. I know you know this one. Um, or we know you have a one in four chance. That's, that's, that's correct, you know, and as they say, the guessing can only help you. We don't, we don't to die for wrong answers. Okay, five, four, three, two, one. And we will share. Said. Oh, hey, again, overwhelming uh, uh, preference for Bertie Edwards, which is the correct answer. And it's the correct answer because of these four names, only Bertie Edwards is not mentioned in a prior adventure. So the correct answer is Bertie Edwards, James Fillimore, Colonel Warburton, and Isadora Persano all were mentioned prior were, in prior adventures. That were not necessarily published. <laughs> right. Bertie Edwards is from the real story and Colonel Warburton's madness never made it, I think. Okay. Although it launched a million uh, pastiches. That's right. <laughs> Okay, now we have number seven. Are we on number? No, we're on number six. You're right. Who's number six? And the clue is you are acquitted. And the possible answers are John Turner, Jonas Oldacre, James Ryder, and Captain Crocker, or Captain Croker for our friends across the pond. You are acquitted is the clue. And your choices are John Turner, Jonas Oldacre, James Ryder, Captain Crocker. Now, this is the point in a Dana Richards quiz where I usually fold my arms and sit back as if I know the answer and maybe chuckle to myself, but I would have had no idea. <laughs> Just watching the answers come in again. Uh, we have well, 71% of those online have now voted. I like to get it up to, to 75%, 74% of you have answered. Uh, the other 25 we'd love to hear from, but we can only wait another five, four, three, two, one. And that's the end of that one. And here's the result. Oh, again, go team. Uh, the, the majority have gone for Jonas Oldacre, and that, that is the correct answer because Holmes did not absolve him of the crime he had committed. Well done. Okay. Number seven, I have an accommodating neighbor. And the possible choices are Vernet. Jackson, Werner, and Struther. I have an accommodating neighbor. Vernet, mm -hmm. Jackson, Werner, and Struther. And remember, we're looking for the one that doesn't belong. And the answers are coming in again, doing well. Uh, Voting is proceeding a little slow again. Oh, here we go. Some more is entering. We go 73%, and that seems to be our 75. Keep them coming, folks. Okay, we're going to say in five, four, three, 
two, one. And here's your answers. Uh, there's no putting one over on the crew we've got here today. 62% have said Vernet. That is, in fact, the correct answer. Vernet did not take over Watson's practice or fill in for him when he went off adventuring. Vernet was, of course, uh, mentioned in another connection. I have a drop of art in the blood, and it's liable to take the strangest forms. Indeed. All right. Number eight, give me a ring. Your possible choices are illustrious client, the Hound of the Baskervilles, the three Garadas, or the retired colorman. Give me a ring. What could that clue mean? And which of these stories is not like the others? The illustrious client, the Hound of the Baskervilles, the three Garadibs, or the retired colorman? And we're doing, ah, see. Answers are coming in nicely. Need another you to finish up. It's like seven of you that have been voting that haven't quite voted. There we go. Okay, in five, four, guess if you don't know, guess. Three, two, one, and we'll end that one, and we'll say, here we go. Okay. The, cor the correct answer has once again won out, though not by the crushing majority that we are used to seeing from this stellar group of quiz masters. Uh, the correct answer was the Hound of the Baskervilles because in the Hound of the Baskervilles, Holmes does not appear to have access to a telephone. There you go. <laughs> Okay, we go to number nine. Number nine, up to code word. Up to code word. One of these things does not belong on this list. Is it radiator, oil pump, sparking plug, generator? I know which one I'm going to for, but that's because Alan has very kindly provided me with the answers. For the rest of you, take your best guess. Is it radiator, oil pump, sparking plug, generator? Up to a code word. Mm. I wonder if you're going to ask Susan to please turn off her microphone. Susan. And thanks to Howard, who is inviting me to wink when I read the correct answer. Now I'm going to have to do everything I can not to wink with the last, with the last clue. Okay, we're up to, we're up to the end of uh, our, poll, our polls on this one. Let's share the results. There you are. And the, the, once again, uh, the majority have gone for the correct answer, which was generator, because that is not a code word used by Altamont. Again, that one was a bit of a thinker. Wow. And speaking of last bows, here's question 10. We come to our last question. Howard, I invite you to watch me very closely because I will give us a, a very subtle signal only to you. Watch for the wink. The <laughs> illustrious client, Charles Augustus Milverton, Bruce Partington plans, or Copper Beaches. And the clue is the guilty. Oh, sorry, Howard. I've got something in my something in my eye. The clue <laughs> is the guilty detective, and the possible choices are the illustrious client, Charles Augustus Milverton. Bruce Partington plans or the Copper Beaches? And um, 
little bit slow coming in, but well. I think everybody gets it in terms of what that clue means. And we're yeah, the answers are coming now. We're almost where we need to be. Five, four, three, two, one. Got that one. And here we go. Once again, you have come through with the correct answer. The majority of you plumped for the Copper Beaches, in which Sherlock Holmes did not commit a felony, as he did in The Illustrious Client, Charles Augustus Milverton, and the Bruce Partington plans. The correct answer was the Copper Beaches. Okay. And so. Alan, I believe we have a lovely living room suite for the winner of the quiz. Yes. Yeah, and a, and a matter refrigerator. <laughs> um, here's what we'd like to do, because uh, you're keeping your own scores uh, and, and all of that. I would like anybody who got, get your typing fingers ready, because anybody who got all 10, please say so in chat right now. Right now. Say, I got all 10 in chat. And I'll give you, well, okay, there's one. Any more? Wow. Howard, Oster, Howard Ostrom says, I, I, I won if you stopped after three questions. <laughs> okay. Since we have, we, we'll wait to announce all the, uh, let, let's go with, let's, let's go with nine now. If you've got nine, type it into chat right now. Don't want to wait too long. Okay. No, no nines. How about an eight? Anybody get eight? All right, a couple of eights. Oh, there's a nine. Oh, a lot of eights. Okay, we don't have to go any lower than that. Um, we can announce then, as you can see, if you're looking at chat, you can see it too. Um, Rob Nunn got all 10. So there, that's just great, right? Well done. Uh, Sean Duncan got eight. Susan Dallinger got eight. James O'Leary got nine. Randall Stock got eight. Lynn Walker got eight. Uh, Howard Ostrom says, I got eight if you count by twos. Okay, Catherine Cook got eight. Very good. Roger Johnson says, of, you know, see, he was just late typing it in because you knew that if Roger was online, Roger, <laughs> Roger would get all 10. For those of you who don't know, Roger goes on quiz shows in the UK as a hobby. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, he's done that. So that's good. Uh, I said Catherine Cook. Okay, Roger. Paul Leach got eight. So we have those scores, we have them enshrined in our chat and, uh, and uh, the, the prizes will be uh, doled out accordingly uh, at, the, uh, at, at the pleasure of Mr. Peter Blau to whom I now return the screen. Thank you, Alan. Uh, thank you to everybody uh, for taking our vicious quiz. Uh, thank you to everybody for coming to the meeting. Special thanks to everybody for staying to the end. Uh, one of the nice things about Zoom is that we can see when you leave, so you can't sneak out. <laughs> it's the same as in a real meeting. You get up and you try and dodge behind the pillar. It won't work. Okay, as a reminder, uh, if you'd like to be on the Red Circle's mailing list, uh, send me an email message. If you have someone you would like to have as our next speaker, uh, please let me know. And James O'Leary says he didn't get his quiz prize from the last quiz. Uh, we award those at our meetings. But I'll have to figure out if there's some way that we can award virtual prizes. Uh, I would hate to overburden the post office by sending things out at this time when they have so much other mail to deal with. But we'll see what we can do. Okay. Thank you all for coming. Uh, we'll see you at our winter meeting sometime in December. Thank you. <laughs>